one, two. Mike check in the house. Check one, two. Oh my word. Welcome to Waco, Texas, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. You can sit wherever you want. Can I sit here? Said the queen of uh, the universe that we wow. exist in here. It's Thank great. you all for coming. Chip and Joanna Gaines, Hi. Waco, Texas. Everyone has a story, and to us, it's worth telling. <laughs> Are you trying to read that wall? I read it. Oh, I didn't try really to good. read anything. I actually read that. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, Joe, what do, you, what do you have to say? Do you have anything to say? I'm just so excited. I've been so giddy for the last week about this event, getting to see y'all tonight. This is the first time I've really talked about the book, uh, like, with a moderator. <laughs> so I, I feel like in a lot of ways, the whole process of this book has been deeply personal, and, and I'm so thankful that Chip is the one that's up here with me, but also that y'all are here tonight with me, too. I just feel like it's a special event, so thank you for being here with us. All right, here we go. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Joe's favorite color is for sure not pink. <laughs> Joe likes black. She likes she likes suede brown. She gray. likes gray. Yeah. Gray, yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, well, I'll share the pink in a second, but just the process of writing the book, it was raw for me. It was it was real. And so I told the team, I don't want to take a picture for the cover. I was like, I'm not gonna do it. I don't want to do hair and makeup. So we're gonna just look in the archives, see what's out there. And this picture happened to be from a day that I showed up in a t-shirt and it was, you know, maybe a year or two ago, and a friend was like, hey, will you just, let's take a couple funny photos for a photo booth. So it was like funny day, photo day. And I did it, and, and I, when I saw this picture, I was like, that's the picture. I wanted the first thing that you saw was kind of, this is just me on every day. I didn't want it to feel too polished and put together. And then now you see when you take the black cover off. I want to do this with you here. So side cover and then you take that piece off and there's a precious little girl underneath. So this little girl, as I was writing, I kept writing to her and so what I had realized in this whole process was the more like her that I can be at 44, the better I will be. I wanted that to be... Her hair's a little disheveled. Yes. She has a tooth missing. I mean, if you saw a, a, a closer up, I have a big scar on my chin. My tooth is missing. My mom that day did my hair and did it nice, but I didn't care. And I think for me, this is just a picture of showing up as you are. Who cares? And then pink. Pink was I my... I had a little girl about that age, when I was that age, and she... who would take my lunch money every time I would go to school. <laughs> and you looked Stop. sort of like I was that. a sweet little girl. You were? Yeah. But the pink is me also going back to that little girl who wore pink every day. And I wanted to go back to that, too. So that's why I was really kind of adamant. I want pink all over my book. I want to celebrate just that freedom and who she was. And so we'll talk more about that, but that's kind of the story of the cover and the two different pictures. So fun. All right, question number two. Why write your story, period, and then why now? It started as um, me journaling and writing down thoughts, and it was never this idea of a book. And so I would say December of last year, I, I kind of looked back on my life and just realized everything felt blurry. I couldn't remember what happened really a year ago, five years ago. Everything just felt so blurry to me. And um, I didn't like that I, I couldn't remember moments. Why was everything so fuzzy and foggy? Fuzzy and because I think I was coming to a place, I was, I was almost 44, you know, I don't know, it's not a midlife crisis, but it was one of those like, gosh, I wanna know as I move forward in life, in this season of life, what do I wanna carry with me and what do I wanna leave behind? And when I looked behind me and I was like, gosh, it was just a whirlwind. We had four kids, what, what felt like the speed of light. I mean, literally one, two, three, four, and all of a sudden you fast forward a minute and a, 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 a production company reaches out and says, hey, would you like to, con you know, entertain uh, doing this television show? Hey, we're thinking it's going to be on HGTV. And it was just like, you know, we didn't know that when we stepped onto that 
uh, moment in time, that why in the road I'm describing, it was like a rocket. You know, it's like we stepped into it and instantly were teleported five, ten years down the road. And it was just fascinating for you to step back and walk us backwards through this experience and how much we remembered, how much we had forgotten, how important it was for us to put those mile markers yeah. in the... In and the, we never really allowed ourselves time to process it. And I think... Life can happen and that's great, but I also think when you can sit and evaluate and process and again hold with gratitude and all the things, then that's, it's just more meaningful in that way. And I think for us the last 10 years has just felt so crazy and exciting, but also it's been busy. And so I think we're, we're both in that stage where it's just like, I don't, I don't want busyness and hurriedness and like to-dos to, to mindlessness, you know, all you the about, stuff, yeah. just like going through the motion. I want to see the magical moments that are happening all around me that are unplanned. And so that's where it all started. It's funny you should say all of these things about this book you wrote. This is not... Your eyes look very green. Right? Yes. Okay. Well... Very intense. So... Okay. Ask the question. No. Ask the question, weirdo. <laughs> Back all the way up? will be an after-hours no. event featuring... <laughs> all right, all right, here we go. This isn't the first time you sat down and wrote a book. I remember when we were just married, you talked about when you were in your 20s how you had written a book, and I was always so fascinated. I'd never known anybody to really... I never thought to write things down really in general, like at all. So when I moved to New York, I went to Baylor, and my... Um, freshman year. What is it called? Your senior year. I'm like, what's that last year called? My senior year in college. Um, so hold your mic right here to your chin. I don't want to do can. that. No? Well, that's, that's like a trick of the trade. No, it's weird. Okay, fine. So my senior year in college, I moved to New York for an internship. And where we grew up in Kansas, um, when I was a little girl, I was the only Asian in the whole school other than my sister. So it was just like one of those things when I moved to New York, I was like, wow, I've never seen this culture um, that's so beautiful and you know and this is something I know that so many of y'all can relate to as we're children we you know you'll get made fun of for something whatever for me it was um, you know being different in being Asian and so these little boys would say the things and then my little mind because I wouldn't process it with anybody would believe oh okay that's not good or who I am isn't good enough so I tucked that side of me and kind of hit it. Well, what I didn't realize is if you never process it, you're, you're really never healing. When I moved to New York, I realized, wow, this is a piece of me that I've hidden for far too long, and I craved it. Every weekend, I would go to Koreatown so I could smell the food that my mom cooked, so I could see the faces that looked like my mother or my grandmother, because I was trying to connect back to that part of me that I had tucked away and hid. And in that process, I started writing. And um, it was a little book I made for myself, which was basically just, I, I told myself, I'm gonna write every, mem every memory I can from the very beginning, from the moment that stole something from me of what I believed about myself. Forgive those kids, but then forgive myself because at 22 in New York, I had a lot of guilt in what I hid, you know, even thinking about my mother and uh, so many parts of my life in those years just really hiding that, like that it didn't even honor my mother. So having to forgive myself for never fully processing it, wishing I would have processed that way earlier so I would have been really proud, you know, of who I truly was. So for me, it was six months of writing down my story from the very beginning to where I was at 22 years old, and it was rewriting every lie with truth. And I, I remember going to New York with this idea that I wasn't good enough, and so I need, to, I need to go find that career that'll say, ha-ha, world, I am somebody. But then in that whole process, I actually fell out of love with that career path, which was gonna be journalism or whatever it was. But I left New York for the first time in my life, really believing that who I was was enough. And so that process of writing down my story was so healing for me. Um, and so I didn't know, I wasn't doing the math, but being 44, the irony that it's 20 years later, I'm gonna do the same thing, but kind of start now from that place of 22 to now, I, I knew instinctively it's time to do this again. Amen.
All right, so New York. All right, another round of applause for myself. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to be here all evening. My next question is that, so you wrote this book when you were in your 20s, and you were processing all these things that you had kind of learned through this experience about being a little girl in Wichita, Kansas, and not fitting in perfectly in, in, in some ways. And then you fast forward, now you're in your 40s, and you decide to write this book. What, what surprised you? What did you learn about that 20 years from when you wrote that first yeah. you know, copy to this, this next experience? I think when I first wrote it, I, I remember coming back to Waco thinking, I'm, I'm good, I'm healed, I, all the things in my past, you know, it's over. Now I can start kind of all over again. And you forget to do that practice or that exercise of, it, probably a daily exercise of what am I believing today about myself that's not true. I wasn't ever perfect, but that striving for perfection, what I learned as I wrote down my story the second time around was, what is the root insecurity of perfectionism? And it's, it's the idea that I have to prove to somebody that I am enough. So I used to pretend like perfectionism was my personality and I'm a micromanager and I'm uh, all the things, like that's just who I am. But as I really wrestled with it, I was like, oh, I still have these things in me that, that I'm believing something because I'm having to prove, who am I trying to prove to, who, who, you know, or even perform for? Um, because I did that my whole life. I was good at putting on a facade. I was good at, okay, in this group, I'll be this because this is what I know they want. And it wasn't until I finally was good with myself that I realized I don't have to prove that to anybody. But for someone like me, that's a daily practice. I wish it would go away, but it's something I have to step up to every day and say, I am good enough, I can do this. And when I smell perfectionism coming around the corner, now I physically get sick over it because I don't, then it's like there's something in me that's not right. So I think for me, it's like there's always a thing, you know, it's like, whatever you're wrestling with, whatever insecurity, or whatever is kind of just like on your back in this season of life, go deep, deep, deep and figure out what is the root of that? What's the actual thing that you're believing that's probably not true? And if you shift your mentality, you know, it's, it, the world's a whole different place. It's a different color when you can see on that side. Amen. You called this the stories we tell. It's just like the idea of like the stories that we tell ourselves that make us feel better, or it's the stories we tell others to make them think that we're enough. What? What? How did you come? How did you come up with the uh, the title of the book? You know what I mean? All of it. Okay, I think yeah. it's just how are we holding our story? How are we using our story? Um, and so I think, you know, and then ultimately when you, if you read the book, the, the point is, is that my story, um, is my story, but we all have obviously these unique, amazing stories. And when we tell those stories and we're all kind of on the right side of it, meaning that we're holding it well, we're holding it with gratitude. We have perspective. Um, it's, it's powerful. I think it's healing. Okay. An excerpt from the book, ladies and gentlemen. Gosh, this is a really odd way to this do this. Weird. I'm sure there was a smarter way to do it. but I, uh, I think I they wanted want Chip to read it. When he saw how long it was, he said he couldn't. No, so thank now, you. Now I'm reading it. Go the ahead. The day we watched our oldest son drive away for the first time, I won't lie, there were a lot of tears. Not from Chip. He was practically chasing Drake down the driveway, cheering him on while I went back inside to gather myself. It hurt to watch my son leave in such an obvious display of what it looks like to grow out of us, this rite of passage now belonging to him. Yet, as I came back inside the house, I remember finding Crew, standing there as though nothing had changed forever. He was simply wondering if I'd come back in to play with him. I don't know how to explain it other than the light softened, my heart swelled, and at that moment I knew how essential this rhythm is to lose and then gain, to have and to hold, only to let go. It was a gift of perspective. Because there was crew tugging on my hand to follow him, and it was this beautiful and gracious reminder of the bigger picture, showing me that highs follows, follow lows, that sorrow and joy can go hand in hand, and that letting go reveals what else our arms were made to carry. Sounds a little like Ecclesiastes, you know, there's a season for each side of this, you know, but 
tell me, so when you wrote that, what was, the, what was going through your mind and why, why did that, that thought make it into the book? Yeah, I think, I think what I was most grateful for about writing the book was, again, that gift of perspective, when I could write that stuff down and really feel it. Um, you know, Chip jokes all the time, I'm not a crier. I, my kids don't know, when they see me cry, they don't actually know what to do, because they're like, oh, shoot. Um, I'm, I don't, that's not normally how I feel. Maybe I realize <laughs> this late in life, I don't want to feel, so I just like block everything. But in the moment of letting that kind of hit me, um, I realized, I don't know, I just, I, I, I don't know if that moment prepared me for what was next, which was like Ella this week driving off by herself. I remember when I first opened the little shop on Bosky, so many of those mothers would come in and all their kids were going to college, and I was there to listen to them as they were crying about it, and I'm sitting there, and, and Drake's crawling around on the floor um, at Magnolia, and I'm sitting there, and they're like, Joe, this is going to go by so fast, and I would look at them and go, you're right, I mean, I can't even get past the diaper stage, but it did go by so fast, and I think that's what took me by surprise. And it's like just that night that you were describing with the with Drake on the ground. It's just like that night felt like an eternity. Yes. How is this gonna, season going to so, go fast? But then this time around, Ella drives off. I knew it was coming, and I was really like, oh, poor Ella. She's going to be sad because I'm not going to cry because I cried all my tears for Drake. And I really thought I was going to have to kind of fake it so she didn't think I liked Drake more. So I was literally preparing to let her go and be like, oh. Um, but that did not have to happen because probably 10 minutes before she left, this thing came over me. And I, oh, I hate when that thing comes over you. You are kind of an ugly crier, I will say. And I'm I, loud. It's just weird. And like so you, you're kind of wailing. It's kind of I awkward. Don't you know? wail. I guess because you have so little practice. I'm, <laughs> I was convinced she was like a cyborg. It was almost like she would pretend to cry, but you would see her use this little spritzer bottle yeah. that would awkwardly throw out these uh, pretend tears. But you've had so little practice at this that it really is an odd thing to watch. So speaking of odd, Drake is standing there as Ella's driving off. And I'm trying not, because I don't want to make him feel awkward. And he's like, Mom, is, do I hold you right now? And I was like, just give me a hug. So I hugged him, and I thought, oh, this poor kid's going to think I'm a weirdo. So I let him, like, and I keep crying. He's like, do I hug you again? And I was like, Drake, go inside. I went to the garden, because that's kind of where I wrestle with everything in life. I went to the garden, and in that moment of really dealing with it, I started feeling all the things rise up, all the mom guilt. Was I there was I enough for her? Did I, did I say the right things to her? Like all that started to come to the surface and I was trying to push it down because I was like, don't, don't guilt me. I'm, this is me talking to myself. And I'm like, but then I was like, you know what? Let it come up. So it all came out and I cried and I just kept hearing this thing in my head say, land on grace, which I've never really allowed myself, I think, as a woman to land in. It's always like, you can do better. You can try harder. You can be more excellent, whatever. Where instead, I felt it all. Give yourself that, because in those moments, you can really beat yourself up. But I felt like I landed in a healthy spot. And, and again, it was gratitude that rose up. And the irony, it's almost like if you look at that little girl, Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all evening. Yes, yes, thank you for the commentator. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Doesn't, doesn't that feel great? I mean, when you just sit and people are just clapping for me. If I had one ounce of this guy's confidence. Oh, I mean, really, but listen, if. the thought that you went, would go back in time and whisper to that sweet little girl uh, that she was enough. And then the irony that then at 40, you're watching your oldest boy and then your first girl drive off and, and, and then you've got all these insecurities. Was I enough and was I there? You know, your 60-year-old version of yourself would come back to you there in that moment and say, you were enough. You're enough, you know? And those kids are honored. It's, a, it's an honor that they have been mothered by you and you've done all the things that you could have ever done even when you take into consideration the mistakes along the way it was just the right it was just the right it was just what the doctor ordered because it was just like who else could have mothered these five babies other than you you're trying to barbara walters me right now and i'm holding it, those tears back babe go to the sad? next question is that sad, <laughs> sad? no no I've got a friendly bet with a friend of mine that I, $100 that I'm going to make her cry tonight, but so far, so bad. Okay, so tell me, there was this button 
it has something to do with that picture of when you were the yeah, little girl. So and it's a silly story that I share in the book. I share it because it was the first moment when I wrote my story, the first time I could remember caring about what other people thought. It was um, that kindergarten, first grade, I don't remember, kindergarten, I think, and um, I forgot that it was a show and tell day. But I was on my way to school, and it was a cold winter day, and I was playing with my um, button on my jacket, and it fell off. And I thought, oh, and I stuck it in my pocket. And got to class, and the teacher you know, got in front of the kids and said, okay, everyone, it's show and tell day. I can't wait to see what you've got. And right off the bat, I was like, oh, shoot, I forgot. So when she called my name up, in my mind, that button was like the coolest thing in the world. So I told everybody, hold on, I've got to go get it. And I left the classroom because my jacket was in the hallway, and I reached in my pocket. Imagine these kids like hanging on the edge oh. of their seat. What they thought I was bringing thing? in a pony. I, mean, I can't um, wait to see what she brought, yeah. you know? And again, just like, whoa, they're going to love it. I'm so happy. I'm so free. And I get to the front of the class, and I hide the button in the back, and I said, y'all aren't going to believe this. And I bring it out front, and I'm like, this is the button that fell off my coat this morning. And everyone's like, total silence, and then all of a sudden, this like eruption of laughter, like, well, that's the stupidest thing, you know, all the things. And, and I, I only say that... I, if I had been there, I'd have been in the back going, your button sucks! <laughs> you would have. <laughs> I felt that. But th that wasn't like a, the reason why it was so meaningful to me is because from that moment on, I remember, A, can I trust myself? Because I was the ding dong that thought this button was brilliant. But also, oh, that hurt. I remember that shift happening. And so that's when I started hiding things. And I did want to show the picture because the following year, I was like, I'm not showing up with messy hair or a busted tooth. So the next year, this is now the polished show. If you can show the picture of me in the red shirt, oh, I showed up. Twice. I wore layers. I wore my yes. pearls. I wore oh. my little. So that's the Even girl the now who cares. Off the <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like, I'm here, everybody. So Golly. you can see, even in a year, feet how things have pearls. changed. <laughs> Hairs immaculate. Smile perfect. Okay. You learned quickly that uh, in order to, uh, to not be made fun of and bullied and things like that, you better, you better be yeah. put together. So I learned quick, for sure. All right. Well, I would like to read a quick little excerpt. This one... Uh, when I was listening to your book on audio, this really stuck out to me. It says, I want to fight to be a woman with that little girl's heart. Anything you want to say about that? I realize the older I get that, yes, wisdom is beautiful and wonderful, but there's also so much to be learned by when I think about my four-year-old son. I actually have learned so much just watching him be um, and it's, it's so enlightening to me that I'm like, I want to be like that. I want to stop and see the leaf um, that change colors and pick it up and examine it and talk about it for 45 minutes and then go put it wherever he puts it with all his other rocks. Because I don't want life to just be so busy and to happen to me really ever again. Amen. As we wrap, babe... I want you to just really, I mean, do your thing. Do that Joanna Gaines thing you do. Drop Chip the is mic. Always the closer. There's Drop no the dropping bomb. the mic. But I, I mean, will say, up, make each it of happen. you got a button on your way in. And that little button is something I wanted to leave you with. Just that simple reminder that, you know, when you stick it in your pocket, um, to just remember to fight for that, fight to go back to that moment. Not again, I don't want you thinking about my button story because it's embarrassing, but really what is the moment where you remember something shifted and you want that back, you want that thing back, fight for that. So let that be like your symbolic button moment for whatever story that you have. And my biggest hope, you know, this isn't about read this, get to know Joe a little more. Really, this was one of those things I didn't actually think I'd share until about three-fourths of the way into the project, I thought, oh, something opened up in my heart because I was at a place where I was wanting to actually hide and not share anything. And by the time I got about three-fourths of the way in, I realized that vulnerability and that 
that um, idea of sharing is really what opens it up for other people to then be vulnerable and then for them to share. And so my biggest hope um, when you read this book is that when you close that last page of my book that you get that pen and you get that journal and you start writing down the chapters of your life. You start rewriting moments where you want to reclaim um, because our story is the most powerful thing that we have. And, and the thing I kept hearing throughout this whole process in writing this down and trying to just reconcile with where I was at and all the stuff is I just kept hearing gratitude is what will move you forward. And so for me personally, after this process, I know what I want to leave behind. I know what I want to carry with me. And I just think I want to challenge all of y'all. There's power in your story. There's power in seeing the gift of how everything, every moment lines up to be where you exactly are right now. Quit, it, quit with all the I shoulda, coulda, woulda. Where you are right now matters. And my hope is that when you put this down, you start writing your own story. I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. It feels like such an honor that we got to share just these pieces of my story with you. Um, I felt like this was like a, a sweet space to do this in and we had a good time. Bye guys. Thank you all for coming.